You may have heard that soil is alive, but if that's true, what does that really mean? And how does it impact the way that we garden? Well, the answer is undeniably yes. The soil is alive and it actually may be one of the most important factors in growing healthy plants. So after watching this video, you should walk away with a deeper understanding of how plants interact with microbes in the soil, along with some easy and practical things that you can do right now truthfully, any time of the year, to nourish the soil biology in your garden. But first, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Taylor, and I help gardeners grow in more sustainable and regenerative ways so that we can all move away from soil deterioration towards soil regeneration. And something that we need to appreciate before we start looking at soil biology is really how recent much of this understanding is in terms of scientific history. I highly recommend that you check out the book the Hidden Half of Nature by Anne Bickley and David Montgomery. This was a tremendously informative book and it helped me understand a lot of what we're looking at here today. We won't go into the book too much, but one thing that it really did for me was that it gave me an appreciation for how recent much of this understanding of microbes really is. It's worth looking at the Linnaean classification system because when I learned about the eight levels of taxonomy in middle school, the category of domain, which is the broadest category, was a very recent addition, and very little was taught on it. Prior to 1990, the broadest category was kingdom, which consisted of monera, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. But in 1990, Carl Woese and his colleagues proposed a three-domain system, broadening the scope to match newer understanding of the microscopic world into archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. That being said, it's only been until even more recent that a more full understanding of microbiology in the soil has been fully appreciated. So with that out of the way, let's jump into this cutting edge science. Starting with the basic question, who lives in the soil? And this is hard to fully narrow down, so I'll start with the broad categories and then we'll work our way into more specifics. So broadly speaking, we've got our bacteria, our fungi, protozoa, nematodes, and our arthropods and earthworms. So five broad categories for our soil biology 101, and there's one more category of living beings relevant to our discussion today, plants. Plants live in the soil. Now that we've got our major players in view, there is a key concept that we really need to appreciate when it comes to the way that all these guys live their lives. The name of the game when it comes to plants and microbes and microscopic animals is collaboration. If we wanted to use a fancy word, we could say symbiosis. So let's dive into how these guys collaborate exactly, starting with a brief reminder on the process of photosynthesis. This is really important. Photosynthesis is kind of a superpower. Plants figured out that they could take light, turn it into energy, and then trade that energy with the little tiny invisible creatures swimming around them. Wild. How it works is plants absorb water through their roots, water gets transported into their leaves, and then using the energy from the sun, the cells in the plant leaves split apart water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen gas they release into the air so that we can breathe and live, yay. Meanwhile, the plant uses the hydrogen atoms with their electrons to make two energy carrying molecules called NADPH and ATP. We won't go into any more specifics here, it's a bit over my head to be honest. The second part of photosynthesis though happens when other pores of the plant leaf absorb carbon dioxide from the air. The plant uses the energy from the last part of the NADPH and ATP to transform CO2 into a storable sugary food source, carbohydrates. These energy bars are what the plant uses to build itself. Now, when I was in high school, this is about where we stopped. And I say this again because so much of the research on soil biology and microbiology in general is incredibly recent. So carbohydrates, these are what our plants use as energy to build their bodies. But they're also used for other purposes. And the very vital purpose that we're looking at is back down at the root level in the soil. For a variety of reasons and in a variety of ways, plants use this food source to stimulate activity in the soil. The sugary liquid is exuded through their roots in specific ways that send messages to the underground soil network and those messages signal a wide range of activity. A few of the main things that they do are, number one, 
They attract microbes who will gladly take the carbohydrate in exchange for nutrients and minerals that they have been able to extract from the soil. This is one of the most important interactions within the whole set of processes. Two, they also alter the pH of the soil immediately surrounding the plant's root system to create hospitable conditions for beneficial microbes who engage in the exchange, or the change in pH creates inhospitable conditions for pathogenic microbes. And three, finally, the plants also use the energy source to exude chemicals that repel other unhelpful soil microbes, other competing plant roots, and diseases. And these are just a few of the ways that plants interact with the soil via their root exudates that we know about. This is also a place where we could dip into the carbon sequestration conversation. However, it's such a nuanced topic with a lot actually happening, so maybe we'll maybe just save it for another video. For now, let's hone in on the nutrient exchanges that are happening. Just like most living creatures, plants need a balanced diet. And the potato chips that they're able to make from sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide aren't going to give them all of that on their own. So how are they gonna round out their diet? For the most part, plants are not going to be able to extract raw nutrients straight from the earth without some help. There are 17 essential nutrients, nine of which are considered macronutrients and the other eight micronutrients. And these are all needed by plants to grow healthily. Again, I'm just speaking in generalities here, very simplified. But a way to think about this is that a plant is only able to get so far without any one of these essential nutrients. Now the good news is that by many soil scientists' estimations, the vast majority of soils contain all 17 of the essential nutrients. The bad news is that not all of them, in fact most of them, are likely not present in a form that is available for plants to consume. This will become really relevant when we discuss practical measures that we can take to address soil nutrient deficiencies. So how do plants gain access to the nutrients that they need to grow? Well, we already mentioned that one of the purposes of these root exudates is to attract microbes who will feed them. So at this point, let's take a look at which microbes we're talking about. And for starters, we're gonna look at the big three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, or NPK. You might have seen this ratio or set of numbers on a fertilizer at the store, on a potting mix or something. These are only three of the 17 essentials but they are pretty key. And when it comes to plants receiving N, P, and K from soil microbes, we're talking largely about bacteria and fungi. Starting with phosphorus, we've got microbes like mycorrhizal fungi. These are long distant nutrient transporters in the soil, along with some bacteria such as pseudonomades and bacilli. So how does this work? Well, from the bacterial side of things, we've got these little guys swimming around in the soil releasing organic acids. And the acids do a couple things. They lower the pH around soil particles. They bind metal ions like calcium, iron, and aluminum that are hanging on to phosphorus. And then they release the phosphorus into the soil water where roots can absorb them. On the fungal end of things, we've got this incredible system where mycorrhizae colonize plant roots and then send out long hyphae into the soil. This sort of serves as an extended root system where now the plant increases its reach into the soil substantially. These fungi also secrete organic acids and enzymes that unbind phosphorus from other minerals and organic matter. Then they absorb the phosphorus and transfer the nutrient through the network directly into the plant's root system, again, in exchange for some sweet sugar. In summary, the problem with soil is often not that it's lacking phosphorus, rather that the phosphorus is unavailable and out of reach. With the help of these two large groups of microbes, the locked up phosphorus becomes not only available to the plant roots, it gets delivered directly into the roots systems. Looking at potassium, we find similar processes at work in the soil. Bacteria and fungi secrete acids that break up potassium from minerals in the soil, and then they exchange the potassium with the plant for root exudates. And when we look at nitrogen, we can see similar things happening, and by C, of course, I mean that scientists see them with microscopes. But unlike phosphorus or potassium, microbes aren't excreting acids to free nitrogen from minerals to then feed to plants. Instead, some microbes specialize in pulling nitrogen out of the air and converting it into ammonium. 
These microbes consist largely of bacteria and archaea. Ammonium also enters the soil pool when decomposer microbes break down organic matter. Other microbes specialize in oxidizing ammonium, converting it first to nitrite, and then still others convert nitrite into nitrate, which plant roots can absorb. Both ammonium and nitrate are bioavailable forms of nitrogen to plants, but in different ways. Ammonium tends to stick to soil particles while nitrate moves with water, making it highly accessible but also highly leachable. When soils are waterlogged, still different microbes, largely the anaerobic facultative bacteria, step in and convert nitrate back into gases that escape into the atmosphere. And this isn't ideal for us gardeners because it means we're losing nitrogen from our soils, but it is a necessary part of the bigger cycle because without it, ecosystems would overload with nitrogen. Now, I wanna talk through the specifics there so that we can begin to appreciate how involved many different types of microbes are in the processing of a single ingredient, albeit one that is very crucial for plant health. In short, various microbes are responsible for shepherding nitrogen through its transformations from the air into the soil, into plants, and eventually back into the atmosphere where it can be recaptured and processed again. We won't go through the unique types of microbes that mine and convert the other 14 essential nutrients, but I do want to touch on a few of the other types of soil microbes that we find abundant in the soil. Protozoa, nematodes, arthropods, and earthworms are all considered major players in the soil food web. Protozoa are grazers. They largely eat bacteria, which they process and excrete the excess nitrogen in the form of ammonium directly into the plant rhizosphere. These guys are like little microscopic fertilizers. Nematodes get a bad rap because one of the types, the parasitic nematodes, attack plant roots, but this is just a small slice of, of this phylum. Nematodes also feed on bacteria, fungi, as well as other nematodes and protozoa, all regulating microbial populations, releasing ammonium into the soil and stimulating root exudation. Arthropods are your mites, beetles, ants and such, which shred dead plant material into smaller bits, mix organic matter into the soil and release nutrients in their poo. Which finally leads us to the fam favorite earthworm. These guys mix up organic matter in the soil, they eat microbes, and process their nutrients. They burrow in the soil, improving aeration and drainage and root pathways, and they fertilize with their castings. And this is still a very brief, simplified overview of all that is happening in your soil to get your plants what they need to survive and thrive. But what does this, all of this mean for us as gardeners? Well, at its core, just knowing a bit more about what is happening down there is actually, is probably gonna change the way that you garden. You're hopefully, a little bit more conscious about what you're putting onto your garden beds and spraying onto your plants. In another video, we'll talk about some concerns that we should have when it comes to the industrial agricultural practices that have infiltrated our food systems, our gardening habits over the past hundred years. But aside from removing tillage, herbicides, and synthetic fertilizers, what are the mental shifts that we need to make when it comes to additions within our practices. The overall mindset that you've probably already started to adopt is that instead of feeding plants in our gardens and farms, we need to be thinking about how we're feeding our soil. And we just released a comprehensive overview of a ton of ways that you can help your soil using homemade solid form soil amendments. So you can check out that video for the full, full, full picture. But for this video, I actually want to keep things as just as simple as possible. And so for the sake of simplicity and practicality, I'm gonna break things up into three types of additions that you could make in your gardening practice that will help restore and nourish the biology in your soil. Those three categories are clothe, plant, and infuse. So hopefully you can walk away with something that is immediately actionable. Starting with clothe. When I say we can clothe our soil, I'm referring to what we would call a mulch. This can be anything from dried leaves to compost to wood chips, even to a landscape fabric. Just something to get the ground covered where bare soil is otherwise present. I've quoted Alan Savory here before, but he has famously said that desertification doesn't cause bare soil. Bare soil causes desertification. And part of the reason for that is that when soil is left uncovered, it becomes an inhospitable environment for the microbes to live. We need to provide a clothing of some kind so that the sun doesn't zap them, the water doesn't wash them away in the topsoil, and so that the ground doesn't become so compact that they can't travel through it. 
mulch protects microbes and organic mulch also provides microbes with a little bit of food source for an added benefit. For your organic mulches, I'm gonna say that for annuals, your veggies and flowers that you replant every year, things like straw, leaf mold, and grass clippings are wonderful options. These spread really easily, which is nice when you have to pull the mulch aside to plant into the soil, and then you can just rake or hand spread the mulch across the soil around the plants. For perennial garden beds, something that breaks down a little bit slower, like dried leaves or wood chips, are gonna work great. These will help you retain and feed the fungal networks in the soil that get established. And the second thing that we can do to nourish the precious biology in our soil is to plant. Plants are one of the best, if not the best, food suppliers for microbes. That root exudate exchange is powerful. Remember that plants and microbes don't compete, they work with each other. And this means that as much of your soil as you can, keep it planted with something as much as possible. Of course, this is where cover crops come into play. If you've got an empty garden bed and no more food crops to plant, give your soil biology a plant partner in the form of a nitrogen-fixing legume or a tasty annual grass with a thick fibrous root system. And then really crucial bit here, when it comes time to remove these plants or to terminate them, and your food crops for that matter, leave the roots in the ground for the microbes to feast on. Don't pull them up out of the ground. Just lop off the top of the plant at the soil surface and leave the root system in the ground. And that way the carbon stored in the roots can be slowly consumed by the microorganisms and your soil will be that much better the next time that you go to plant in it. Finally, in soils that have seen really hard times, maybe chronic tillage or Roundup spray are a part of its story. You may need to take the initiative and inf infuse the soil with some homemade concoctions. And again, if you're a returner to this channel, you know we're all about getting into the nitty gritty complex DIY ferments. For the sake of this video, I wanna keep it doable. So a simple Jadam liquid fertilizer is probably one of the best ways that you could get started. You make one of these by soaking crop residue or weeds or lawn clippings in a bucket with a handful of leaf mold soil found from the forest. Let it soak, ferment, it'll become stinky and full of microbial activity, and then you can use that to wake up depleted soil. Another homemade simple ferment that you can make is a lactic acid bacteria concoction. Check out our video on that. It's very simple. You're basically letting starchy rice wash water sit for a few days in a jar, feeding it whole milk, and then collecting the whey that separates out. One of the easiest bacterial infusions that you can make for your soil. Another way to infuse your garden with biology is by mixing some worm castings into the top few inches of your garden soil. Worm castings contain a huge amount of helpful bacteria that are especially helpful in veggie and flower beds. If you're looking to boost your perennial systems, fruit trees, and bushes, you'll want to check out our video on how to make a fungal dominant compost that you're unlikely to be able to find anywhere at the store. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope that that was informative without being too overwhelming. Hopefully you've got a little bit better understanding on why we want to care for our soil biology in our gardens. If you're interested in growing your overall understanding of gardening in ways that are more aligned with nature and that save you time and resources, you'll want to sign up for my email newsletter. I send out five minute bite-sized lessons on what you can do to build soil, to grow healthier plants, and much more. These emails are also designed to scale in difficulty so you can try new techniques little by little as you go. We also make free resources available to our newsletter family and let you know when we have new resources available to help you in your gardening journey. We've got hundreds of people who have already signed up. We're starting to close in on a thousand people which is really exciting. So if that's you, thank you for joining us. We've also put together a YouTube playlist of some of our most helpful videos, specifically on ways to repair dead soil. So if you have a garden that you're hoping to turn around, check out that for some ideas on things that you can do any time of year. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.